The first race to world first for the World Soul Saga is done. The cleanest victory we have seen in a long time. Viewership was slightly down. And of course, now we have a proper big third place attack. So maybe at the next race, a three-way dance. Let's talk about Narubar Palace. Race to world first. The race to world first was an adventure this time, my friends. An absolute adventure. Where do we start with this? Obviously, without going into too much detail, just to spur on the comments, Echo came into this with some issues running into the, the 10 days before the race started. And also, I didn't get to join until Mythic had was about to start. I came a week later than everybody else, as did Nagura. Uh, we had our streams to take care of, and it was a heroic week going on. This was actually kind of really upsetting for me. I, there's, there's new players there. This was the most players Echo had ever taken to the Race to World First. And I usually have a routine of meeting and greeting the new players because I'm going to be talking about them a lot. Uh, so Thana was new. Mini I'd met before many times, so I was okay with Mini. But Hopeful was there as well. Wolf Disco was there as well. Canix was there as well. All these people were there. Nice memes who I'd never met before, but I didn't get a chance to talk to them. I know it sounds weird because we're in the same building, but they're gaming relentlessly, right? So you, don't, you can't like go up and say, hey, can I talk about your past and history? history and all those kind of things that couldn't happen and the fomo of being here while the race was going on my attention was fully fixated on what the guys were doing it also meant that when i got there these guys were already a week deep like the casters which would play into it later on because it turned out to be uh i don't think this is arguable that it's the most difficult raid ever made genuinely i know people go well what about sepulchre sepulchre we nearly beat on both sides of the pond the pull count of sepulchre despite there being significantly less bosses like these and there was nothing weird like Holondras, which came out of nowhere this time it was the best tuning for the race to world first that blizzard has ever done was that down to heroic week have they used some sort of we even talked about this, is there some sort of ai algorithm they're using which is like taking all the stats and figuring everything out because it was spot on on the health values which made things very odd for a community which is used to blizzard not getting this stuff correct right uh which was uh something we'll i'll get to in a second of how odd that was so coming into this echo was doing pretty well they were keeping like if we go through the first few days they were kind of keeping up with liquid but they weren't playing their best yet and i, I talk about this a lot because it is absolutely true uh, is that there's a point in the race usually when echo gets some sort of lead where they flip and until that point they don't play like the world first team and then it flips when they get something gets them going and then they all just suddenly rise up and then they become the world first team that we know of uh, as echo the world first team right and that hadn't happened yet they were just kind of liquid was getting to a certain point Echo was getting to like the same point or like slightly further ahead, but that puts no pressure on Liquid because they're like, oh, you're like 5% ahead or whatever. And then they come in and then they do that in the first hour and then they carry on and carry on. And I, they were never pushing ahead, which was like, okay, not like we haven't seen this not happen until the very last boss before. It has happened that way. Um, so, okay, it's kind of the way it is. And then things started to get weird. So coming into this race... I'm sure many of you were predicting where was the hard boss going to be. I actually thought they nailed it in Amirdrasil, which was putting like Smolderon as the end boss, quote unquote, similar to kind of Anduin, um, uh, all the way back in Sepulchre, of being like the quote unquote end boss for every guild in the world besides the Race to World First guilds. That requires you to not do any mega comp switches and have multiple classes available. You can get to that boss uh, with just really good play if you're a fantastic guild. And then what Blizzard did is tune to the bosses after that, in week one at least, to be Race to World First bosses. These things are stupid hard. They're crazy, crazy hard. And they're going to require a lot of utilizing all the resources that the Race to World First guilds have to overcome them. This time we saw that happen as this raid just went off a cliff in terms of difficulty immediately after boss 4 and boss 5, 6, 7 and 8, arguable with 7, were just astronomically more difficult than boss 4, which was, let's just say, awful design by Blizzard. It left hundreds of guilds just hard stuck for no apparent reason. And this raid in general, I think a lesson that Blizzard could come away with is it every raid should probably have a couple more bosses that give a nice linear progression for the rest of the world because i think it's pretty clear right now 
The intention is, one, Blizzard loves making these super hard bosses, creating very cool stuff that they can push their limits as developers as well as the players. But also, they need to bear in mind the rest of the player base is that they just make sure that there's something that's like the, a quote-unquote like quote, quote, end boss for everybody else. And anybody who pushes past that is now in the real, you know, you're in the grit then, you're in the soil. So I think a lesson coming away from this is to make sure they have that. Eight bosses just isn't quite enough. Ten to eleven bosses makes a lot of sense for making that work. So we had predictions going in which were based a lot off historical precedent. They weren't wildly out of whack of like, Brute Twister should be relatively easy for a coordinated guild because it's about managing spawns and positioning and things like that. Nothing that's super difficult for a world first guild. Uh, Kai Vezer is going to be a single target boss. So that's the one we suspected would be like your smolder on your big, your big sack of health that needs to be defeated, but is within normal realms. I think like smolder on went down like 40 pulls for both guilds, uh, in Amidrasil. That makes a lot of sense. They can do absolute, they've got like heroic splits and all sorts of min max farming of gear. They should be able to overcome the DPS check pretty ca ca handily. Uh, Qu Queen's Court. Uh, was the one where people suspected this is up. This is where it's going to be turned into Tindril again, which is going to be just mega hard. Uh, and then obviously into a very, very hard last boss like we've seen with Farak, etc. So that's what we predicted. Was not the case. <laughs> Brood Twister was easy to coordinate, but my God, did that thing have HP. <laughs> my God. To see the comp changes. I, I don't think I've seen a raid in history where the comp on boss 5 was entirely different to the comp that was on boss 6. Like, you really had to have a massive roster of multiple classes and players of a world-first ability to tackle these fights. Like, a crazy amount. Like, being able to draft in 5 Death Knights and then maybe 4 or 5 Arcane Mages on the next boss, that's insane. That's so much work. And this is boss 5 and 6, and we were like, what the hell? What was really funny for me is the guilds seems to go up to, because you have a choice of whether you can go Brute Twister or Kai Veza, is I think both guilds looked at Kai Veza and went, well, that HP isn't correct. We'll go to Brute Twister. Like, they have obviously made our HP too hard. I think it was like seven, it went to, uh, it was 777 billion, which we thought was an FF14 reference, for those of you who know, you know. Uh, and then they buffed the HP by a little bit. And we were like, huh. And then they dropped it by a little bit to like 7.5 or whatever it ended up being. Like very, very close. And we're like, what the hell is going on here? Like they're being very gentle with the changes here where we were kind of expecting a stronger nerf. Um, certainly wasn't expecting to be like seeing guilds one tank these bosses. But it turns out Blizzard had figured out almost to the, to the decimal with a, a, probably a 3% margin of error as to what the guilds should be capable of to defeat these bosses, and they were bang on. And that was going to be the trend for the rest of the raid. And I think, uh, I can only talk from Echo's side, it kind of threw him for the loop. It's like, Blizzard's usually just not this good. And we don't trust that these numbers are right. And they were, which was weird. Uh, interesting. But with Brood Twister falling and then Kai Veza one tank strats, it's surprising to find that the Silken Court was the easiest of the four. Now, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, the feedback from the PTR from both guilds. I heard internally, I know, uh, I think Max did some stuff publicly. He's like, this fight's just ridiculous. Uh, I saw some other videos produced by, we didn't last more than 30 seconds in this fight in an hour. Um, I think they probably did two things here. One, they were like, okay, this is maybe a little too much and turned it down. But also, given there was a heroic week, which meant that splits were limited to like one day instead of multiple days, like we see in the past uh, for the heroic runs, is that they thought, this if we don't nerf this, this is going to go into like three resets. That's too much. <laughs> that is way, way too much uh, of what we're asking here. That's risking like sepulchre burnout happening again. We don't want that. Like Blizzard has openly said they're aiming for like 10 days-ish, right? 10 days for the world first race. And that would have pushed it to maybe 15 or 16, I think, if uh, uh, the the Silken Court would have been as hard as it was, it was potentially going to be. So I think a wise decision actually by Blizzard to make it a little bit more flexible, increase that margin of error to like 10%, that you could get away with faults, some people dead, and you'd be fine uh, in order to overcome that fight. But still a fun fight nonetheless. Uh, and also, I think, uh, we'll get into this in a second, I think the visually the most easy to follow for viewers who are not playing these fights. 
Anserek turned out to be extraordinarily brutal. Like, this was a... For me, Anserek was the peak definition of technical planning. That is phenomenally good if you are a major WoW nerd. Like, to figure out the exact damage profile of every single person in your raid. How every single button they have available needs to work. How every single yard of movement on the boss needs to be carefully considered and pre-coordinated. From a mega WoW nerd standpoint, mwah, chef's kiss. From a viewer standpoint, unless you have that knowledge uh, of what the hell these guys are doing intricately, I think less interesting than something like Farak. Like, where blaze lines, big red lines that are shooting across the floor, and seeds being popped is visually very obvious. And one thing that a lot of esports uh, creators will tell you is that as close as you can get fights to red versus blue, very simple, the better it is. It's one of the reasons things like football and hockey are so popular is it's very obvious. One team is trying to put the, 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 the puck or the ball into the net. Easy game, right? Any 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 fool can look at that and not understand the sport and go, oh, they're trying to put the ball in there. They're trying. To, I, I get what's going on. Uh, if your fight is ultra mechanically intricate to the point that it's not visually clear what the hell is going on, why everything is timed in a certain way, it's less easy to follow. Uh, there were some mechanics which were easy enough to follow, but considering a lot of it was like, oh, you missed one person in a pool in phase one leading to an extra dot stack which then amplifies a detonation which actually doesn't happen in like 10 seconds into a grasp which is a constant stream of damage followed by the yank which is going to give you um x amount of damage while this is going on but this character can nullify it so they're standing here and this character doesn't do any damage during this point because their damage is going to be inefficient and they're actually saving it for the next one that kind of stuff can get lost in the weeds a little bit, and the viewership was down here. I did point out to a lot of people, though, is like comparing any race to a Mirdrasil, which was the perfect storm, um, is a poor choice of comparison uh, because that was everything. It was perfect. It couldn't have gone better with a Mirdrasil in terms of the race to world first. It, like, that's what you want to see. So that was... Um, it didn't have as high viewership and not unsurprising. It was a feedback I heard from a, a lot of people. It's like, I don't really know why everybody's dying all the time, but they're all dying all the time. Uh, in terms of the players, though. Okay, so, like I said, Echo was keeping up, but that was it. They were keeping up. And then for one Friday, that's when I knew they'd lost. And I think the rest of the players 100% knew they lost. They had a Friday on Anserek where they just made no progress. Like, uh, it was a hard tilt, I guess we could say. Uh, of whatever it was but at that point they'd lost a full day and two things happen when when you have an occasion like this one you tilt hard and you just lose all the potential you had to not only pull ahead but gain a, a significant and robust lead which is what they needed at that point but the second thing that also happens is your opposition in this case liquid is also going to wake up and see that they're not even behind they've rested they've slept they've got another full day of prog and they're not even behind that is like the 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 goat situation you're just gonna you're just gonna fly at that point like yeah we're, we're just ahead we're just blatantly ahead and at this point we're ahead by a day we're a full day ahead and they maintain that lead all the way through echo did okay next few days but they weren't playing as the world first echo there's no getting away from that they did not have a great tier um they they pushed through but uh, it was not their time and it, they were competing against the liquid that was absolutely just consistently playing fantastically there was no falter that I could see. I, of any falters that I got to watch, which was very little, I don't get to watch a huge amount of it because I, I'm obviously casting for Echo and I'm sleeping when they're usually doing their raiding. But little bits, like, a couple of, couple of, like, hours of, like, eh, this wasn't too great, but then consistently just pulling ahead. That was, that was how they played. And with that level of consistency in this difficulty and performing just so, so well on a just regular basis, there's no competition there. And Liquid took what I would say is probably the cleanest least dramatic uh least drama filled i should say uh victory i've seen in the race to all first in a very long time like emergency was ultra close to the wire it could have been either any of them it was like if this pull if this pull if this pull and then people start looking at individual players like it was their fault on that pull blah 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 which is nonsense this time liquid just was way ahead they were just absolutely phenomenal uh and never faltered Let's There's an essence go. all the way at the end. It's fine. Just do not Let's touch go. the essence. It's fucking Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Let's go! 
wonderfully clean. Got to be so happy with it. Really good. The surprise, of course, was Method. Uh, rising up to getting into that contention spot of actually like, oh, you know, when people start talking about like Method might take this before Echo. That was not something I thought, uh, I don't think many people thought was actually going to happen, but the conversation is happening now of like, they're pretty damn close. They're really damn close. I want to see, and I've always wanted to see, more guilds in contention. So we actually have a three or four or five way dance happening at the top end because it makes the race far more interesting than the two horse race we've had for a very long time. As a fan of the race overall, that's what I want to see. I don't think they're quite there yet, but they're getting there. They're really close to getting there. And the real test for method is if whether they get the ability to pull ahead and then start developing their own way of killing the boss. That's the real test, is meeting a challenge that has no answer, that another guild hasn't solved yet, and making it work. That's what I want to see. Overall, I think this was a really... I think this is in the upper echelons of a great, great race to world first from a technical and mechanical and performance standpoint. A level of difficulty we've not seen and tuning we've not seen from Blizzard all coming together. I personally would love to see, from a, from a viewer's perspective, um, more, more visually red versus blue style mechanics that we can all work together. Like a Holondrus bomb going off makes sense. All of Frack made sense. Tindril made sense. A big obvious seed is still up. We can all be on board. We get the seed, get the seed, get the seed. You know, when they're clearing those seeds. Uh, the wonderful swooping animations. All those things weren't quite there outside of Silken Court for me. Uh, and I want to see more of that. Because what Blizzard did numerically was outstanding uh but these bosses were definitely like a maths nerd dream and again this is from a visual perspective uh rather than i know some people are like i could tell what's going on you sure but we're talking to a wider audience uh and then bringing it back in and obviously we want to see um we want to see the gills at each other's throats side by side uh which hopefully we will see the next race that's what we want to see we don't want uh don't i i as um i well i never want in the race to world first is a scenario where we had for a while where it was one guild versus everybody else uh we had that for quite a few tiers back in the past and it was kind of boring uh we want that mix up and now seeing the title of the champions pass backwards and forwards between the guilds and then a stellar performance from liquid here what i hope is this lights um, a hunger and a fire under echo especially to be like all right we need to be beating a liquid that potentially never falters that means we have to play better. Let's see if we can get that uh, coming into the race next time. But that's how I feel about it. What a race it was. If you were a super fan of the Race to World First, this was everything you needed. It was tight. It was meticulous. It was technical. The best tuning performance Blizzard has ever accomplished occurred here. However, difficult to watch. Difficult to follow. A lot of people just seeing people dying left and right over and over and not really sure why, even with commentators trying to express it to you. But what an outstanding performance from Team Liquid. Now it's on Echo and it's on Method and potentially the Hot Pot Heroes to show what they can do the next time it comes around. And we'll be right here to tell you all about it. So stay tuned. This race is just heating up.